I'm not sure what we should read into the fact that this talk on uh, adolescence is in the session on animal cognition. <laughs> Actually, whenever I tell people I work on adolescence, it seems that um, making a joke about adolescence isn't just socially acceptable, it's completely obligatory. People say, what, you work on the teenage brain? Does that actually exist? Or, you know, good luck with that. <laughs> um, it's kind of curious that it's totally acceptable to make fun of this whole section of society, and I'm not quite sure why we do it. Um, OK, so what, the reason I became interested in adolescence uh, are twofold. Firstly, um, because it seems to be a sensitive period for uh, the development of um, the development of uh, various different psychiatric and psychological illnesses. So things like depression, anxiety, eating disorders, schizophrenia, addictions, they tend to have their onset during the period of adolescence. A second reason why I'm interested in adolescence is because uh, it seems to be a period of life where we undergo a kind of transformation. Of course, physical, hormonally, we change, but we also change in terms of cognitive and, and particularly social cognitive processes. So um, to illustrate this, I thought I'd read you a letter that was written to the Guardian newspaper. So the Guardian is, an, is a British newspaper. And this is a, a letter by a reader who says, there's nothing like teenage diaries for putting momentous historical events in perspective. This is my entry for the 20th of July, 1969. I went to the art center by myself in yellow cords and blouse. Ian was there, but he didn't speak to me. Got rhyme put in my handbag from someone who's apparently got a crush on me. It's Nicholas, I think. Ugh. Man landed on moon. <laughs> I love this letter. I think it's such a nice characterization of what it's like to be a teenager and what the world looks like to a teenager. This is a really important period of life where you develop a sort of very profound sense of self. Your sense of self undergoes change. Um, you, you, know, you become very um, preoccupied with things like what you look like, what you're wearing, what music you like, what kind of person you are, your moral beliefs, your political beliefs, who you hang out with. This is a period of life where self-identity really profoundly comes online. That's not to say that children don't have a sense of self. Of course they do. But what really matters to a teenager changes. Um, it's a period of life where there's a drive for teenagers to become independent from their parents and their families and to become affiliated with their peers, with their friends. So the sense of social self undergoes change as well. And that's what, I'm, uh, that's what my work really focuses on. So um, one area where... <laughs> one area of... <laughs> One area of research where uh, the, the um, effect of one's peers has on behavior is in the domain of risk taking. So it's well known, we all know that teenagers take risks. Risk taking in many different circumstances peaks in, uh, during the teenage years. And this has been studied for many decades uh, in social psychology and more recently in the lab, particularly by uh, Larry Steinberg, who's a very, very famous researcher of adolescent development at the uh, Temple University here in the US. So he's brought teenagers and other groups into his lab, and he gets them to take part in a kind of driving video game that looks like this. So they drive around like a video arcade game, um, and you can record the number of risks they take, like the number of red lights they drive through, how fast they drive, how many crashes they have. So he tests um, three groups in this particular study, adolescents who are 13 to 16 year olds, young adults, 17 to 24 year olds, that's the uh, green bar, so the adolescents are red, the young adults are green, and adults 25 and over in white. This uh, graph shows the number of crashes they had when they were being tested on their own. You can see that actually the number of crashes, any kind of uh, measure of risk shows a similar pattern of response, is very similar for three groups when they're on their own. However, when they have a couple of friends standing behind them, that dramatically <laughs> increases the number of risks adolescence takes, doubles the number of risks young adults take, and it makes no difference to the number of risks that adults 25 and over take. And this kind of data is borne out by driving insurance company uh, 
epidemiological data. Yes, young people do have more crashes than older adults, but if you look at the circumstances under which they tend to have crashes, it's almost always when they have a same-aged passenger in the car with them. So, um, Thinking about this research, my PhD student Kate Mills and I have recently been starting to think about a framework for adolescent typical behaviour. So if you think about any kind of decision that you make, so it might be a kind of health-related or risk-related decision, like shall I drive really fast? You weigh up various pros and cons of driving really fast. There are advantages. It's useful. It might get you somewhere quicker. You might get a kick out of driving really fast, but on the other hand, there are also um, disadvantages, like you might crash or you might get caught by the police and get a speeding ticket. In addition to those pros and cons, there's another factor that weighs in in all decisions we make, and that's a social factor. We all behave differently when we're in groups compared to when we're on our own. We, we make decisions differently when we think other people are watching us or judging our decisions. And what we're suggesting, which has been suggested before in various different guises, is that the social factor weighs in more heavily for adolescents than at any other uh, period of life. So we're really interested in the social brain and how the social brain develops during the period of adolescence. And what I mean by the social brain, which, which you have heard much about already today, but I like to illustrate it with this nice photograph of uh, Liverpool, Liverpool Football Club, that's a soccer club to you, <laughs> um, and Michael Owen, who's a very famous English uh, soccer player, just having missed a goal. So what this picture shows you uh, is two ways in which your social brain works. Firstly, it shows you how automatic and instinctive social emotional responses are. So everyone within a split second of Michael Owen missing this goal is doing the same thing with their arms and the same thing with their face. Even Michael Owen is as he slides along the ground. Um, <laughs> Uh, except these guys aren't here in yellow, but I think they're on the wrong end of the stadium. <laughs> um, and the second aspect of the social brain that this photograph really nicely illustrates is how good we are at reading other people's behavior. You don't have to ask any of these guys just from looking at their face, their bodies, their gestures, their behavior. You have a really good understanding of what they're thinking and feeling at that precise moment in time. And I think that that really is theory of mind. The ability to read other people's behavior in terms of their underlying mental states and emotions. Now, in developmental psychology, we've heard a little bit about that. We're going to hear more later. Um, theory of mind is mostly focused on preschoolers. And we know that it, theory of mind development undergoes a kind of stepwise change in the first few years of life. And that's really nicely illustrated here in this video. This is a study by Tomasello and his group showing uh, spontaneous helping behaviors in 18-month-old toddlers. So these toddlers just came into the lab, weren't given any instructions, and the results are quite clear from watching this video. Oh. And look at the eye contact at the end. <laughs> like, duh. <laughs> um, so, in order to show that kind of spontaneous helping behavior, that infant, well, you could argue that that infant must have inferred a mental state in that adult. It mu he must have inferred the intention of the adult was to open the cupboard and put the books in. So that really is theory of mind. It develops it before 18 months, and it continues to develop after 18 months. And I'm particularly interested in how uh, mentalizing and the social and the neural correlates of social cognition develop in the period of adolescence. So how does the social brain develop in adolescence? Now, just very briefly, uh, until 15 years ago, we did not know how the brain develops in, in human adolescence because we didn't have the tools to look inside the living human brain. We, we relied on uh, developmental neurobiology in animals and the very small number of post-mortem human brain studies. There were just very few out there, and there still are very few. But in the last 15 years, uh, people have discovered a great deal about how the human brain develops across the lifespan by using MRI scanning. I'm sure many of you have had MRI scans for various different reasons. Um, MRI gives us very high-resolution structural images of the human brain, 
uh, using which we can measure things like white matter, which contains the long fibers that connect up neurons together. And we can also, also measure gray matter. Gray matter is mostly found in the cortex, the surface of the brain, and contains many different things, including cell bodies, so neuronal cell bodies, and connections, the synapses between cells. And we can also use MRI to measure brain activity. So we put people in a brain scanner and look at uh, which parts of their brain are working when they're doing a particular task. So when you do that, uh, you find that um, if you get people to do some kind of mentalizing or theory of mind task, as we've already heard uh, earlier on today, you find a circumscribed network of brain regions is activated during theory of mind tasks in adults. And I won't go into, any of, into the details about this network. Suffice to say that there are four or five regions involved. And these regions are consistently activated when you think about other people's minds. It actually doesn't matter how you get people to think about other people's minds. You could get them to read stories or watch videos or cartoons. As long as they're thinking about other people's minds, this region, uh, these regions, this network of region, regions will be activated. So in a recent study uh, with my PhD student, Kate Mills, and our collaborator, Jay Geed, at the NIH, uh, we've been looking at the structural development of the social brain in adolescents. So Jay Geed runs the biggest uh, pediatric neuroimaging project at NIMH, where he has uh, scanned children, adolescents, and adults as they get older for the last about 15 or 20 years now. So in this particular study, we uh, looked at brain scans from 288 individuals aged between 7 and 30 years. Each participant is scanned uh, um, between two and seven times, at least two years apart. So we're working with a total of 857 scans. So it's a relatively large study. Um, so we focused in, I'm just going to show you one data slide, we focused on those areas within the social brain network, which we defined from adult studies. And basically, the, the, um, so what you're looking at here is these four regions of the social brain network. It doesn't really matter which ones they are. They all show very similar developmental pattern during adolescence. Between the ages of, uh, well, 7 and 25 in the total sample, but the um, the ages are, are on the horizontal axis down here. This is the volume of gray matter on the vertical axis. The middle um, line is the uh, developmental trajectory across the entire sample, so all 288 individuals. The top line in each graph is boys, and the bottom line is girls. So um, the first thing that you should notice is that each of these regions undergoes very significant development during the period of adolescence. And in each region, uh, there's a kind of cubic relationship between gray matter volume and age. Uh, and during adolescence, there's a very significant decline in gray matter volume. Um, that is thought to correspond to a very important neurodevelopmental process uh, at least in part, it's thought to correspond to the process where connections between cells are pruned away. And it's not a kind of neurodegenerative process. It's thought to be a really important process where the brain becomes fine-tuned to the environment that the person finds him or herself in. Um, there have also been lots of functional imaging studies, so fMRI studies, of the social brain uh, network during adolescence. And I won't go into any detail because I don't have time, but just to show you this meta-analysis of nine different fMRI studies, the only nine <laughs> fMRI studies that have compared social brain activity, or bold signal, as, we, um, as, as it's called, from uh, the activity from the fMRI scanner, uh, in adolescents and adults. And all nine of them show the same thing, which is that this region of medial prefrontal cortex, right at the front of the brain, uh, shows a significant decline in activity as you go through adolescence into adulthood when you think about other people's minds. We don't know why that is. We don't know why adolescents activate this region more than adults do, but we think it might have something to do with the, the cognitive strategy that they use to do these kinds of tasks. And that leads me on to my final, uh, the final kind of um, section of my talk, which is looking at uh, cognitive behavior during this period of life. So we know that the social brain develops both in terms of its structure, gray matter, and also its function or activity during adolescence. What about social cognitive behavior? Remember right at the beginning of this talk, I told you that most developmental psychology research points to very early childhood as the period of life where theory of mind develops. Um, most theory of mind tasks 
um, reach ceiling effect after about age five. That means after age five, there is no continued improvement on those particular theory of mind tasks. But with my uh, former p a postdoc, Iroise Dumonté, we wanted to find a task that doesn't result in ceiling effects, even in adults. In other words, we wanted to find a task that uses theory of mind, but that results in um, a lot of variance in performance, even in adults. So we used this task called the director task, originally um, designed by Kayser and colleagues, where you see a set of shelves and you see various different objects on these shelves. There's a director standing behind this set of shelves. And the critical point here is that some of the objects that you can see, he can't see because they're occluded from his point of view or his perspective uh, by this opaque piece of wood or whatever. And this is the same set of shelves from the director's point of view. Now, he's never going to be asking you to move objects that he can't see. He will ask you to move objects around, like he might say, move the cow down, in which case you take the cow with a computer mouse and you'd move it down one. So this introduces a really nice, uh, kind of interesting conflict condition, where there's a conflict between your perspective and the director's pe perspective. So imagine he asks you in this condition, move the top truck up. So there are three trucks here from your perspective. However, he can't see this top one that you can see. So from his perspective, he must intend you to move this blue one here. And that would be the correct one to move. So in the original version of this task, normal, healthy, intelligent adults made errors about 50% of the time in these trials. And they moved this top truck from their perspective. Apparently, the, their own egocentric perspective interfered with remembering to take the director's perspective and uh, allow that to guide their decisions. So we introduced a control condition where here there's no director. He's gone. And we tell you, OK, now all you have to do is remember a rule. And the rule is ignore objects with a dark grey background. If an object has a dark grey background, don't touch it. Um, so in this case, you can see that if we say move the top truck up, it's exactly the same condition. You, you go for this one because that's the top truck, but then um, you realise it's got a grey background, so you don't touch it. It's exactly the same condition, actually, except you don't need to take someone else's perspective into account to guide your decisions. So I'm going to show you the results. Um, this is percentage errors. So the higher the bars, the worse people are doing. And we tested about 180, in this case, uh, female participants between age 7 and 27. So these are five different age groups here. And I'll now show you the data. So um, the, the, these are percentage errors in blue for the director condition. That's when you have to take the director's perspective. And in green for the no director condition. If you look at the adults first, so our adults are making errors in almost 50% of trials where they had to take the director's perspective in order to, to move the correct object. But in the no director condition where they just had to remember the rule, they're performing much better. Developmentally, these two conditions follow an identical developmental trajectory, just improving gradually between late childhood and mid-adolescence. However, after mid-adolescence, there's a difference, and that is that there is no continued improvement in um, inaccuracy for the no-direct condition between mid-adolescence and adulthood. However, the ability to take into account the director's perspective to guide ongoing behavior is still developing at this relatively late stage, in somewhere between mid-adolescence and adulthood. So, so perspective taking seems to be changing uh, during late adole adolescence. That's not to say it ever gets that good. <laughs> Adults are not very good at this task either. Um, so what I think is developing isn't theory of mind per se. But the usage of theory of mind in order to guide decisions and actions, and actually that, if you think about it, is much more like how we use theory of mind in everyday life. We use it all the time when we're making decisions and acting and behaving in the world. So just to summarize, the adolescent brain is still developing. It's still very much in development. The social brain develops in terms of structure, function, and behavior in adolescence. And social acceptance by peers, we, th we think, is a key determinant of adolescent typical behavior. So thank you for listening, and thank you to my research group. <laughs> <laughs>